So Hebrews chapter number 11, verses 32 to 34. says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Jephthah, and, and of David and Samuel and the prophets and Andrew and Jonathan <laughs> and Will and Pam, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Amen. Amen. Time, the writer of Hebrews said, would fail me to tell you about these other folks. I've told you about Abraham, I've told you about Moses, and told you about Sarah, and told you about Cain, and to told you about these guys, and Abel, sorry, but time will fail me to tell you. Um, I want to take some of that time that the Hebrew writer failed to tell you and tell you a little bit about Gideon tonight. Amen? Amen. So look at your neighbor and say, we're going to be talking about Gideon's army. Hallelujah. Tonight, I want to, I want to announce, from the outset, let me say, if you go away with nothing else, just go away with this that you are a candidate to be used by God. And no matter how insignificant you feel inside, and no matter how much you see God using people and what they're doing, please note that everyone inside has their own trepidations and have their own fears and has their own sense of insignificance that they have to fight. So what you see presented is not always what's going on on the inside. And we can see that through the Apostle Paul's life when he talks about the wars without and the fightings within. That everybody suffers somewhere with a sense of unworthiness, a sense of insignificance, a sense of why God me? Can you really use me? And even while God is using you, you're still thinking, God, why are you using me? I want you to go away tonight when we hear the story of this guy Gideon just knowing that God has chosen to use the unlikely people. That God has chosen to use the things that man refuses, God uses. It says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 28, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose to use what is low and what is despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. God chooses to use what man refuses. The truth is, if it was about me calling myself, I would disqualify myself. I would think of myself as unworthy for God to use or unworthy to be used. If it was about me calling me, and for many people, if it was about you calling you, you would not call yourself. The truth is many of us disqualify our, ourselves in our minds about God using us. And tonight we're going to look at a story of a man who did just that. In his head, in his heart, in his mind, he disqualified himself by, from being used. He had a dream, he, he had a desire, there was something inside of him that wanted to see more. We know this because when God came to him, he said, where are the miracles? That sounds like a man that is saying, I know that there is more, but why am I not seeing it? He said, if you be with us, then God, then why is all of these things that I'm seeing happening? Why are they happening? This tells me that there's something going on inside of Gideon long before God called him. There was a desire inside of him to see transformation. There was a desire inside of him to see miracle signs and wonders. But he had a lot of questions. 
as to why these things happening. And if God, you are the God that we've heard about, if you're the God that I've read about in the book, if you're the same God, the same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever, then where are the miracles that I read about in the Gospels? Touch your name and say, where are the miracles? Saints, when you, when you read the book of Acts, and you see the explosive growth, and you see converts, people being converted, when you see whole cities of Samaria coming to God, throwing down idols, when you see the lame walking and you see the dumb talking and you see blind eyes opening and you see the apostles performing special miracles, we must look back and say, where is the God of the book of Acts? Isn't that what Elijah said? Where's the Lord God of Elijah? He's still the same. Touch your neighbor and say, he's still the same. We're, save, we're serving the same God. Now the truth is, so many people are satisfied. So many people think that they have everything that there is to be as a Christian. They're contented with just going to church every Sunday, hearing a pretty sermon, singing a few lovely songs, and then going home and coming back the next week to repeat. But I feel like I'm in a room with a people that are hungry. I feel like I'm in a room of a people that know that there is more. I feel like I'm in a room of people that believe that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that we could ask or think. I believe I'm in a room of a people that believe that God is able to transform this nation to transform Great Britain, to transform Africa and the rest of the world in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, I've just got to drop this in before I get into what I want to say. Uh, as I was worshiped there, I, <laughs> I think I heard the Lord say, as we were worshiping, and, and take this from someone that loves to sing, loves to dance, loves to lift my hands, loves to worship. But I, as we were singing, um, I will always worship you. Here is my worship. And I was, here is my worship and singing. I felt like I heard the Lord say, Peter, do not confuse worship with just singing. Singing is more. And worship is more than singing. And worship is more than lifting your hands. And worship is more than dancing. It's more than music. Abraham said, me and the lad are going up yonder to worship. And he was not going up on that mount to sing songs. And he was not going up that mount to dance to music. And he was not, he was going up there to kill something. He was going up there to sacrifice something. And I felt like I heard the Lord say, tell my people that true, when you say, here is my worship, it's obedience to the word. It's obedience to what God said to do. So when Abraham said, me and the lad are going yonder to worship. He's saying, I'm going to obey what God told me to do. And I feel like God has said, go into all the world. Amen. Did God say, go into all the world? Touch your name and say, have you gone yet? <laughs> True worship is obedience. And seriously, as I was standing there, God reminded me of my first, if you like, mission. Uh, back in 1991, I went to Pakistan. It radically changed my life, my worldview. It changed everything about me. I went out there, you know, as someone that was just bringing people to the Lord, seeing people healed, etc. And when I, went to, when I went to Pakistan, I remember praying for some people. And I remember them saying, I can hear, I can hear. And they're saying they can hear. I'm thinking, you wasn't deaf. <laughs> like, I realized how much unbelief I had. Because here was God doing miracles. And, and the problem was, because in England, you have to pray for like 15, 20 minutes. But here, people were just spam. They were just being healed. And I had to fight with my own unbelief. I, I watched a, a young man who had polio and his legs was completely bent in like that. And I watched God absolutely perform a creative miracle and straighten his legs. Now to the point 
where the Muslim villages that were at, on the outside of Martinpur, where I was, when they heard what was happening the following morning, at like seven in the morning, they started to bring their sick. They started to bring their lame because they heard that Jesus was in this village. Believe me, guys, when we begin to do the works of God, amen, we won't have to argue with Muslims when they know that the name of Jesus still works. When they find that there's power in the name of Jesus, they will bring their sick. God will heal them and they will be saved. Come on, clap your hands. So touch your neighbor and say, go to the nations, go to the nations. Just go to the nations. Just go and see what God will do. He will you will be radically changed. You will never be able to go back. You will not be able to go back. Amen. Now, the Bible says in Judges 6 verse 11, that Gideon was fresh in wheat in the wine press. Everyone say he was hiding. The Bible says in chapter, verse 1 of um, Judges chapter 6 that the Midianites, who were a great army, because Israel had sinned against God, God sent this Midianite army into Israel to oppress them for seven years. And the Bible says that these Midianites harassed, bullied, they terrorized, they intimidated these Israelites. Every time they planted their crops, as soon as it was harvest time, these Midianites would come along and they would just take everything. They would destroy their crops. They would destroy their cattle. And the Bible uses the word, they impoverished Israel. In other words, they brought them low. They brought them to the point where they cried out unto God. But Gideon, the Bible says, was hiding. He was threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, a wine press is where you crush grapes. It's where you make wine. It's not where you fresh wheat. In wine presses were generally on low ground, where you're stumping out grain. Now, to fresh wheat, you have to go to higher grounds. You have to go up into the hills, into the mountains, because you need to catch wind. In other words, you have to catch wind that can blow away the shaft. In other words, he was in a low place where God wanted him to be in a high place. And many of us are hiding in a low place where God wants you to come up a bit higher. Because when you go up a bit higher, then you can catch the wind of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can blow against you, and then God can blow out the shaft that's in your life. He can blow out the fears and the unbelief, and he can blow out the stuff that's in your life. But we have settled for lower ground. Many churches have settled for lower ground. But thank God, thanks be unto God, you are in 412, and we are not settling for lower ground. We are going higher. We believe that there is higher ground. We want to catch the wind of the Holy Spirit. Touch your neighbor, nudge them, and say, let's go higher. We want to we wanna catch the wind. But what he's doing, he's hiding. And so many people are in hiding. We're hiding from the bully. We're hiding from that which is harassing us, from that which is intimidating and destroying a harvest and setting us back. Every time you plant seed and every time you do something good, it's like something bad happens and it just, you can't seem to get harvest. You can't seem to get traction. Yeah, Amen. You've done so much work, preparation. And then when you get to the end, your harvest is destroyed. It's the Midianites. Now, the interesting thing about the Midianites is that they are actually distant relatives to the Israelites. Because after Sarah passed away, Abraham married Keturah and gave birth to a son named Midian. And Midian, the Midianites, actually were relatives to the Israelites. And it's like the Lord said to me that some, the enemy without can't really do much. Oftentimes it's the enemy within. That we are fighting the decisions of our forefathers and former generations, and decisions that they made that we are battling with now, and that they are enemies within. 
that actually the enemies without, we don't need to worry about them. We need to de de deal with the enemies that's within. The ones that we're fighting, especially the enemy in me. Dealing with the enemy that's inside of you. That one that stops you the most. That one, that voice inside of your head that's talking you down. That voice inside of your head that's saying you're not worthy. The one that's inside of your head that says people are going to laugh at you. The one that's inside of your head telling you that people don't really like you. Amen. That enemy inside of your own head that's fighting you and stopping you. That you're battling with. Now I felt the Lord say to just share with you that we all battle with these internal voices. There was a young girl on Sunday at our church. She's an Asian girl. And I saw her in church and she, I came at the end because I preached another branch and I came and I saw her at the end just worshiping. I said, man, you're here, you're here. She says, yeah, I'm here. Three months earlier, I saw her outside of our church building. And I said, come in. And she said, no, I can't go in there. I said, why? She said, I feel like if I go in there, fire's going to burn me. She said, I feel like if I go in there, I'm too unworthy to walk in there. But on Sunday, she was there in the house of God, lifting hands, and God had delivered her from that fear. Amen. Now, which means that we all have those kind of fears. We're battling with those unconscious fears that are not real. But God will set you free from those fears. Amen. The battle inside of your own head. I think I was sharing with Ewan earlier today that I feel like I'm fighting myself because I feel like God is saying, I want you to carry more. There's more I want to do. I, I, I'm wanting to bless more. I want more churches. I want the ark to expand. And I'm like, man, I'm just about holding this thing together. We're so growing exponentially. I mean, last Sunday before, we welcomed 47 new members in. Like, I'm like, God is, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, you're, you're trying to grasp it and you're feeling like, I can't carry it. And it's, God is saying, listen, it's not about you. It's not about you carrying it. Amen. God says, I will carry it and I will use you to be a vessel. But I have to fight my own feelings and I have to fight my own self-constraint. That ceiling that my sister prophesied about that. Where you have these ceilings where you're kind of like, yeah, this is enough, God. This is enough. And God say, no, it's not enough. There's more. Touch your neighbor say, there's more. Now you probably, when you see me, you probably think, nah, you don't fight with that because you just seem confident and etc. But you just don't know. Do you know what I mean, Ange? You just don't know your own battles. And I know God is saying, many of us here, we have our own internal fightings, beliefs, struggles that we're fighting against. Amen. But God says you're going to overcome them in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Bible says that as this is happening and Gideon is fresh in this week in the wine, by the wine press, an angel comes and sits down under an oak. And an angel looks at Gideon and says, the Lord is with thee. Mighty man of valor. <laughs> Think about it. He's in hiding. He's a coward. He's scared to death. He's in the wrong position. He's in the wrong place. And God says, God's with you. Mighty man of valor. And it's like, Gideon must have thought, Can't be talking to me because I don't feel like no mighty man of valor. I don't, I'm not acting like no mighty man of valor, which means that God sees more in you than you see in you. Amen. And when God addresses him this way, God is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon says, if the Lord is with me, then why is all of these things happening? Why is all of this oppression? 
Why are we being harassed by these Midianites? Why do they come and take our harvest? Why, is, why are we being terrorized the way we're being terrorized? And the answer is sin. Chapter 6 verse 1 tells us because Israel did not obey the Lord. The answer, I mean, it's, you don't need to sit down and have a debate and figure out what's going on in the world. Why is all these things happening in the world? The reason why all of these things are happening in the world is sin. And you don't need a philosophy cast to work that out. Sin is the reason for it. It's sin. Everyone say sin. Sin is the reason why all of this stuff is happening in our world. And that's the thing that Jesus came to deal with. He came to deal with sin. So God answered him. And then the second question he said, if, if it be so, and if I am, and we are this mighty man, then where are all the miracles that we've heard about? How God opened up the Red Sea, and how God split rock and water gushed out. Where's all of the miracles? Where are all of the signs? And the Bible says that God gave Gideon a series of signs which were like little miracles and it's like, it's like God give me a sign if, if, if these things are true then God give me a sign if you're really with me then God and it's almost like God if, if the, what I read is true then let me try out something and see if it works if I am going to be bring deliverance then God, give me a, a few little signs that let me know that God you're with me, and God caused fire to come out of a rock in verse 21 of chapter 6 that licked up a sacrifice of the bullock. And then in chapter um, 7, the Bible, or chapter 6, 25 to 32, God told Gideon, I want you to go and tear down the altars of Baal. So many people think about Gideon going into, before he did that, he had to tear down some altars. God says, I want you to go and dismantle all the altars of Baal, and I want you to, to raise up an altar for God. Now, he knew when he did this, this was going to cause some problems, because people don't like you dealing with their idols. No one likes their idols to be touched, their altars to be touched. And during the night, the Bible says, because he was afraid, he went during the night, and he completely tore down the Baal's idols, and he erected an altar to God. And the following morning, the Israelites got up and said, who did this? And they said, Gideon did it. They says, right, he's dead. Which means, guys, I feel like God is saying, you need a sign. I'm, there's some things I need you to do. I need you to get rid of that fear. There's some idols, there's some bare altars that need tearing down. And I feel like sometimes we're afraid to touch some altars. But think about the reformers in the Bible. For them to bring revival into the land, oftentimes they had to tear down high places. Did you know people have these idols? Church people have these idols that we hold on to and we don't want to let go of. And dare the preacher touch your idol. You don't mind shouting when he's touching someone else's idol. But when he begins to touch your idol, you get offended. I'm not going to church anymore. The preacher's picking on me. He, he was talking to me. Someone told him my business. Amen. Sometimes God is going to deal with the idols in your life. There's some altars that need tearing down in our lives. Wrecking altars. And the third thing God, sign God gave to Gideon. Gideon said, God, I need a sign. He said, all right. He says, I'm going to take a fleece and I'm going to put it out, God. And if when I wake up in the morning, that fleece is full of water, but the ground around it is dry, I'll know. And he wakes up in the morning and the fleece is full, ringing just with loads of water. The ground around is completely dry. Miracle. And then Gideon says, all right, God. All right, just one more. Bear with me. This time, next morning, I, I want the ground to be soaking wet, but the fleece to be dry. And it's almost like he's testing out. He's testing God for miracles because he's saying, God, if this is true and I'm going to be going with you, I need to see your miracles at work. And God said, we need to test him out. Look at your neighbor and say, test him out. 
In other words, we're going to have to overcome some fears and see if we're going to see the signs of God. There's some things that we're going to need to do. We're going to have to pray for somebody and challenge God to bring healing to them. We're going to have to dare to share our faith and believe God's going to bring them to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you know how wonderful God works? A sister called me last week and she, she said she was in the park walking her dog and she lost her phone. When she got in her car, she realized she lost her phone. So she drove back to the park and started to look for her phone in a little bit of a panic. Uh, she has a job with some high celebrity clients on her phone, so these numbers are vitally important to her. So anyway, there was a young um, 18, 19-year-old black boy in the park, and he said, what are you looking for? She said, I'm looking for my phone. And he started to help her look for her phone. Anyway, he said, should I ring the phone for you? So she, he rang the phone. The phone rang, and a lady answered it. And she got her phone back. And then she decided, you know what? Because you helped me, I want to tell you about Jesus. So she began to tell this young boy about Jesus. And then she called her husband, Kenny, who is my good friend. We grew up together. And he began to speak into this young man's life. She invited him to church. So it just turns out he didn't come that week. She texts me, she texts me this week. She says, you never guess what? This young man just sent me a text. She sent me a series of texts. And he says, what church was you going to take me to on Sunday? She said, the art church. She says, he said, is it in Forest Gate? She says, yeah, why? She says, my sister's been going to that church. And Sunday, gone. He came to church. Now, sometimes God's going to make you lose some things so that you can find a soul. When you experience disappointments, maybe stop and ask God, is there an appointment in this? Is there something you want me to do? Amen. And so after he gets these signs, he begins to tell God. God says to him, you're a mighty man. I'm going to use you. He, and, and he gives God of all of his questions. And then he begins to give God his objections. He says, God, in case you didn't know, I know you're omniscient, but my family is the poorest of all the families. I'm from Manasseh, one of the smallest tribes. And within that tribe... I am least in my house. Meaning, my brothers and sisters, they've got degrees. I ain't got none. They've got big jobs. I ain't got none. They're, they're favored. I ain't got none. And it's like he begins to give all of the objections. Why? I'm not this mighty man that you're saying. And you're telling me to go in this thy might. What might you talking about? My family's poor. We don't have a lot of money. I'm the least in my father's house. I'm from the smallest tribes. I've got all the excuses of why I am not qualified to be used by God. And I, I, I could just imagine if God had time to deal with him. Sometimes God ain't got time to deal with all of our objections. He could have gone back and said, well, come on, just look at Joseph. And, and look at Moses. And look at Abraham and Look at all these people that I've used in the past. They were unlikely people. They weren't the cream of the crop. They weren't the best of the bunch. God specializes in picking up nobodies and using them for his glory. Amen. Look at your name and say, I'm one of them. If you don't think so, then praise the Lord for you. God bless you. So he gives all of these stuff. I'm the poorest. I'm this. And God just says, go in this thy mind. He's going this thy mind. Don't worry about all of that. I've got plans to use you. I'm going to use you for my glory. I need to have a man to deliver my people from these harassing Midianites. I believe God is looking at our world and he's looking for some men and women to use across the world. Amen. And I believe he's in this room tonight, and he's earmarked you. He's handpicked you. He's got his hands upon you. He sees what he's going to do in you, but he needs to convince you to believe in you. God believes in you. I, I thought, I think it was two years ago, 
I was wrestling with that in my mind. That we've always heard about actually trusting God, trusting God, trusting God. But the greatest miracle actually is that God entrusts me. He entrusts me with the gospel. He entrusts me with the kingdom. He trusts me with his people. He trusts me with his church. He trusts me with this calling. He trusts me with this. He puts this power in an earthen vessel, in a broken vessel. God trusts me. He trusts you. Hallelujah. Are you still with me here? I've got a great guy. I don't know who that is. I'm feeling you, though. I'm feeling you. So listen, after God finally convinces Gideon that he can go, Gideon's got 32,000 men. I mean, there's grass up. There's the, the, the Midianites are like grass up, as the Bible describes them. There's, the, the Bible calls that they're, they're innumerable. There's like millions of them. And Gideon's got 32,000. And God says to Gideon, yeah, in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many to give the Midianites into their hand. Let Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand save me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from the Mount Gilead. 22,000 people returned. Left 10,000. So God took all that time to convince the guy that I'm going to use you, a mighty man of valor. He's got 32,000 against the numeral, and God says it's too many. We need to reduce your number. Interesting now. God says, I'm going to put two tests out. One, the fear test. Who's fearful among you? Go home now. Gideon's got this church of 32,000 people, massive auditorium. Singing wonderful. I mean, 32,000 people when church shows up, car park, lots big. And then he, he preaches this message this Sunday morning. Anyone fearful in this church? You can go home thinking probably one or two might go out. 32,000. 22,000, sorry. 22,000 people leave. Fear. Everyone say fear. Sometimes that's the great, I mean, most of, that's the greatest thing that we have to fight. We have to fight fear. But God has not given us a spirit to fear. But he's given us love, power, and a sound mind. And God said, do not be afraid. He says, fear not. He says, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Joshua don't be afraid. I'm with you. God says, fear not. Touch your neighbor and say, fear not. If we are going to reach this nation with the gospel, then we cannot be afraid. I know the Midianites are intimidating. I know they've been harassing and bullying you, but you have to face your fear. I said, you have to face, if you're going to be a soul winner, you have to face the fear. You have to face the fear of rejection. You have to face it if you're going to be a soul winner. One lady came to me one time. I was selling our church on Thursday. And she said, she says, you need prayer. I said, what for? She said, you have the spirit of rejection. I said, what is that? She says, you don't like to be rejected. I said, well, who likes to be rejected? I mean, you think I'll wake up in the morning? God, please, today, let someone reject me. God, I pray, please, I want to be rejected. You know, I'm not walking around Sunday morning saying to everyone, please, reject me. Can you reject me? Reject me, reject me, reject me. Nobody in their right mind. It's a psychopath that wants to be rejected. So I looked at her and I said, yeah, I do have it. I don't want to be rejected. But listen, I will never allow 
that fear of rejection from stopping me from sharing the gospel with someone because they have a soul that is eternal, then there is a lake of fire that they will burn in unless they are born again. And I will not allow the spirit of fear from stopping me. I will not allow the fear of rejection from stopping me from preaching the gospel. Do you know how many churches are never planted because of fear? Do you know how many ministries are never birthed because of fear? Do you know how many prophecies are never given because of fear? Do you know how many people have not received healing because of fear? We have to get rid of the spirit of fear. I remember going to a hospital and there was a man who was dying of AIDS in this hospital. This is back when there was a lot of epidemic of AIDS. And I remember going to the hospital to pray for this man. And the devil, as I was walking towards the room, the devil was saying, if you lay hands on him, the AIDS is gonna come into you and you're gonna get AIDS. And I remember going and thinking, should I lay hands? Or maybe I'll just pray from a distance. Should I anoint him with oil? Or should I just pray from a distance? And I had to battle fear in my own head. And I had to look back in the gospel and see that Jesus was touched by lepers. That lepers touched Jesus. And Jesus touched lepers. And the healing power in Jesus brought healing to the leper. It didn't, the leprosy didn't come on Jesus, but the health of Jesus was transformed to him. And God says, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And I had to face my fear. Walk in that room and pray for that man and believe God to bring healing to his body. Touch your neighbor, say, fierce, face your fears. It's fear that stops us from stepping out. As soon as you hear that there is a, a mission trip, as soon as you hear that there's a trip going to the nations, do not be afraid about where the money is going to come from. Just say, I'm going, I'm going. Because the moment you make a commitment, the money will come. It will. Don't allow your fears to stop you. Don't allow your fears. You, you have a prophetic word and, and God is saying something to you. But the fear inside of you saying, don't go and share it. Supposing you're wrong. Look at your neighbor one more time and say, face your fears. Some of you are wondering, who's preaching tonight? Is it me or, the, or him? I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm not used to this. Verse 4. So the, the fear test. He's left with 10,000. And then God says in verse 4, Gideon, the people are still too many. <laughs> I mean, Lord Jesus. And God says, take them down to the water and I will test them there for you. Gideon's probably thinking, you're not testing them for me because I don't, need, I don't want to test them. I'm, I'm cool with the 10,000. You're testing them for you, not for me. I didn't ask for this. <laughs> And anyone who I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, will not go with you. And he takes them down to the water. And there's a group of guys that go down on their knees. And they put their head down to the water. And they begin to drink with their head down in the water. But there's another set of guys that scoops up water in their hands, and they begin to lap it, the Bible describes, like dogs, out of their hands, while their eyes are up, and God says, these are the guys that I want you to take, 300, everyone say 300, 300, God reduced him down to 300, he says, the people that know how to drink, they're the ones that I'm going to use, amen. What does this mean? Jesus said, if any man first, let him come unto me and drink. What is God looking for? He's looking for people that know how to drink. I'm not talking about vodka, Heineken, Bacardi, Ciroc, or whatever. I'm talking about drinking Holy Ghost water. Amen. 
This water that will make you drunk like Peter on the day of Pentecost. This water that will make you be filled with the Holy Spirit. This water that Jesus said in John 4, that will make you never thirst again. God is looking for people that know how to drink. Are you thirsty tonight? Do you know how to drink? Do you know how to press in? Do you know how to come into the presence? Do you know how to be thirsty? Do you know how to worship to get more? Do you know how to pray to get more? You can't be mamsy pamsy about it. You can't be casual and indifferent about it. You've got to come in with a hunger and with a thirst in. You've got to know how to drink. They're the ones that God's going to use. And God says, the one that laps like dogs. Now, when I read the story, for metaphor and typology, I would have thought more choose the guys that bent down on their knees, right? Because he like, you know, the ones that pray. <laughs> like, I mean, the metaphor works right. But God says, no, the ones that lap like dogs, they're the ones that I want you to choose. And what is God saying? You know, there was a woman in the Bible that the Bible says she came to Jesus for a miracle. She was a Gentile. And, and Jesus said, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. What's God looking for? He's looking for some people that are not ashamed. He's looking for some people that don't have pride within them. He's looking for some people that are just like dogs. They just do not care. They're not concerned about their image and what they look like. Amen. He's looking for some people that will lap like dogs. And the other thing that God's looking for, he's looking for someone that has clean empty hands because for them to put their hands down into the water they had to get their hands clean and their hands had to be empty God is looking for some people that has clean empty hands and God says set these people aside they're the ones that I'm going to use for my glory someone shout hallelujah so let me just finish off and take this home with you guys clean empty hands got their eyes on the enemy they know how to eat crumbs that fall from the master's table. And God says, there's one more sign I want to show you, Gideon. And you can read this in your time in Judges 7, verse 12 to 14. God says, I want you to go down to the Midianites' camp. And I want you to listen to what they're saying. I want you to listen to their conversations. And Gideon takes one of his guys and he goes down into the camp of the Midianites. And he hears, they wake up in the morning and one guy was telling the other guy his dream. He said, I dreamt a dream last night. And in the dream, I saw a barley loaf and it was rolling down the hill. And this hill, this barley loaf came and smashed into all of the tents of all, the, all of us Midianites and destroyed us all. What a crazy dream. In the Israelite culture, barley bread was like the cheapest um, Monday. It was like cheap bread. It's not, you don't make bread from that. That was what poor people ate. It was insignificant kind of thing. It was like, it wasn't Hovis, if you like. It was Tesco brand. Anyway. And, and the, so there's a point here. And the guy turns around to the guy and says, he's like he interprets his dream. He says, that's Gideon. That, that's no one but Gideon. Gideon's going to come and destroy us. In other words, that insignificant barley loaf, that balmy barley loaf that you saw represents that balmy barley Gideon. Insignificant, nothing, impoverished. He's going to come and wipe us all out. Now, God said to say to us, this, if you reverse this around, guys, this is Israel going into the camp of the Midianites and hearing their talk. When the Israelites heard this, confidence came in them. And God kind of said to insert this to us, we must be careful of our speech around the unbelievers and what we are saying around the world. Because sometimes we are conveying fear. We are conveying the world's this and the world's going to be that. And, that's, and we're not conveying. We need to raise a language of transformation, kingdom coming. 
They need to hear a kingdom language from a kingdom people. They, we, they don't need to hear from us that we are afraid that everything they're going to take away our powers and they're going to stop us as a church. What they need to hear is nothing can stop the church of the living God. What they need to hear that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the living God. What they need to hear, amen, is that if God be for us, who can be against us? What they need to hear is greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. They need to hear us speaking our faith and not our fears. Because if we voice our fears, they will draw confidence. But we need to voice our faith that lets them know that we shall not be moved. That the church ain't going nowhere. That the more you persecute us, that the more you come against us, is the more we're going to grow. Isn't that what it says in the book of Acts chapter 7? That the more they trouble them, is the more they grow. The more they oppressed Israel, is the more they grow. The church is moving on. I said the church is moving on through the highways, through the valleys. We are moving in power. We're moving in glory. We will not be diminished. We're taking the nations for God. Someone shout hallelujah. So careful what you're saying. Let me close. It's the last close. I'm not going to be like Paul. Three things they had in their hands. They had a pitcher. They had a trumpet. So two things, a pitcher and a trumpet, and they had their voice. And God said, this was their battle plan. God says to Gideon, Gideon, I want you to split the people up into three, and I want you to go and blow the trumpet. They had no swords in their hands. You know that? Read the story. They had no swords. But they were supposed to proclaim from their mouth, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. What sword? You ain't got no swords. You've got a pitcher and you've got a trumpet. That trumpet is not a sword. Gideon says, when I blow this trumpet, I want all of you to blow your trumpets. And when you blow your trumpets, then I want you to break the pitcher. And when you break the pitcher, inside the pitcher, there's going to be some lamps, burning lamps. The picture represents us, that we must be broken. The trumpet represents the gospel. We must sound out the gospel. And then they were to say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The sword of the Lord and of Malani. The sword of the Lord and of Davis. The sword of the Lord and of Chilean. And as they declared this, and as they proclaimed this, amen, the Bible says that the Midianites, they fought each other, and they destroyed each other, and they took off running, and the Israelites chased after them and completely wiped them out in Jesus' name without a sword. I've said without a sword. So we've got to take our pictures. That's your broken vessel. That's you, the earthen vessel. And inside this earthen vessel, there is a lamp of the Holy Spirit. But I need to break myself so that the light that's within inside of me can shine out. Someone say amen. And then I need to take the trumpet gospel of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And it needs to be blown. We need to blow the trumpet in Zion and declare, amen, war, amen, against our enemies. And then we need to declare the sword of the Lord. And of Chris Staples, the sword of the Lord, and of William Marais, the sword of the Lord, and of insignificant Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Harriet, and whoever your name is. Look at your neighbor and say, what's your name? Say, it's the sword of the Lord in you. Tell him it's you. God's got his hands upon your life. He's going to find you in your hiding place. He's going to find you where you are hiding from, your harassment from the Midianites. Amen. And God is raising up an army. He's raising up his church. He's raising up his bride. He's raising up his people. Come on, stand with me right now. If you believe God is raising you up, he's raising you up for such a time as this. We are the Esthers of the day. We are the Nehemiahs of the day. We are the people. We are the Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigos of the day. We are the Gideons of the day. We are the Samsons of the day. We are the Deborahs of the day. This is the generation that God chose for you to be born into.
Amen. Come on, everyone, say the sword of the Lord. And the 412. The sword of the Lord. And of living out. The sword of the Lord. And of all for Jesus. The sword of the Lord and of Ark. The sword of the Lord of Joshua Generation. The sword of the Lord of Unity Life Church. The sword of the Lord of every congregation in this place today. God is going to use your life mightily for his glory and his glory alone. Alone. So this is what I want. If there's some people out here, you just resonate. You heard what I've said. And you know out there, you've been inside. There's been the internal fighting battles with your own self. As yourself as insignificance and all the reasons in the world why God can't use you. Did you know Peter Nembard, me, Peter Nembard came out of school, didn't even take an exam. Missed everything. But that did not stop God from using me. I said it didn't stop God from using me. I don't have no qualifications, but it doesn't stop God from using me. I'm not from a rich family. It didn't stop God from using me. Your color of your skin don't stop God from using you. Amen. The family that you're born in don't stop God from using you. Amen. God is looking for people that are vessels that he has chosen. The things that are not, the things that are foolish. <laughs>